Hello everyone. Hi, my name is Vibhor Bansal from the NASCOM products team. We are back with another webinar on the management. This is part of a series of webinar on the uh, on the subject in which we are talking about uh, more of a practical approaches of the product management uh, and the project management uh, areas. Uh, today uh, we have uh, Mr. Sundar uh, Balasubramaniam from Intuit uh, with us. He is uh, he is the season uh, product manager, a director of products at Intuit QuickBooks for their desktop uh, uh, product. Uh, he uh, prior to Intuit, he was at he was a vice president of products for uh, Lumata, which is now Evolve Systems and he managed UK based companies portfolio in real time contextual marketing, mobile loyalty, advertising and also responsibility of uh, and also had a responsibility of product delivery uh, uh, there. And besides that, he had an experience. He was a product director at uh, uh, British Telecom in UK uh, for their e-learning business. He was uh, uh, he developed a several recommendation on strategic investments for group CEO's office. Uh, he started his career uh, at a company called I2, which is now known as JDA Software in US uh, for their supply chain consultant and client manager. Uh, he's completed his MBA from INSEED and master's from U Maryland. Now today, uh, Sundar uh, is uh, uh, going to talk about uh, when a product manager is considering uh, switching between different domains, whether it is a B2B to B2C or uh, from SaaS to a desktop or from an industry, uh, you know, vertical like FinTech or retail, uh, what, are the, uh, what are the skills that are relevant in the new domain? Are the product management skills very domain specific or is there uh, switching domain is uh, how easy is it or how difficult it is for a product manager uh, between uh, different domains i will not take much of a time between you and sundar and uh, you know ask him to come uh, to come on board and talk about uh, talk more about the subject before that i will just make a couple of uh, announcements just one thing that at the end of the webinar you will uh, see a feedback uh, the feedback is very important for us because it also gives us that what you all wants to learn and listen from us and we can plan our for uh, you know future sessions accordingly uh, the product management webinars are happening every alternate thursday at the same time so you can uh, you can register to the uh, to these webinars on a nascom events page and you know uh, leverage this platform as much as you can Sundar, uh, I will not come uh, in between you and your audience. You take it up from here, please. Thanks, Vibor. Um, thanks for thanks for joining, and thanks everyone for joining the webinar. Um, I will switch back and forth between the slides and and myself, uh, largely because I would rather that you heard what I had to say versus um, slides. And so the slides you will see are very low on content, um, but I'll switch back and forth. Um, but before before we get started, quick housekeeping on um, legal disclaimer very quickly, uh, so you know what what this webinar is about and is not about, and I'll move on. So um, as Vibor said, thanks again for a for a lovely introduction. I'm the director of product management at Intuit. Um, at Intuit, our our mission is powering prosperity um, around the world, and we do that through these four products that you see here, which is TurboTax for tax, um, personal tax that is, QuickBooks for small business accounting, ProConnect for professional tax and accounting, and lastly, Mint for personal finance. Um, we like to believe that we are a 30-year-old startup. We keep reinventing ourselves every, every decade or so. We have about 8,000 employees across 21 different locations and nine countries, and we serve um, 46 million customers. So that's a in a quick brief on on, on um, where I'm coming from, and very quickly, who um, a little bit about about me. Um, and here, I, I deliberately have put this out um, to make a couple of points. 
uh, this is not meant to be um, uh, to read out, read out of my CV, but really to highlight a few points, which is that if you look at where I started, I started here in customer support and consulting. And this is really just to uh, highlight the point that there are multiple roads to a PM career um, and not everybody is a, a born PM. I started in care and customer support and eventually landed in PM. Um, and I'll talk a bit more, little bit more about my experience in customer support and how that lent into um, things like customer empathy. I moved on from there to uh, application consulting and eventually landed my first role in, as a PM. The second point I wanted to highlight is um, you know, the different domain that I've switched over the period of time. You would, of course, expect me to say that given the topic of this webinar, but you know, just to make the point that I switched across from small business accounting to mobile loyalty to I started in master data management, e-learning, fixed line. Um, you know, there's a gamut of um, domains there that I switched, but a lot of that with the PM hat. Um, and lastly, you know, I'm sure some of you will know that the role of a PM itself is pretty nebulous. Um, so as you can see, I've worked in you know, business strategy, product strategy, product marketing, and of course, product management. But all of that, you know, wearing the official hat of a PM, right? So that's that's a little bit about me uh, and how it's relevant to what I'm going to say for the rest of the uh, couple of hours. Um, so coming back to today's topic, right? Um, are PM skills um, specific and domain specific? It, there is there is something ironic about product management as a, as a domain itself, as a profession, because as PMs we are all about you know, specifications and specificity, and yet um, you know, if you look at product management as a profession, it's it's fairly loosely defined. But now, given this ambiguity, the question is, you know, what are those core skills you need to develop as a successful PM? And does this change from one domain to the other? And when you change from, let's say, a domain to the other, do you have to learn, unlearn? Do you abandon what you've learned? That's the larger question I will try to answer. I will, as part of this, I will go into what are those four um, key skills but I'll try to focus more about how this changes from one domain to the other. Um, before I go there, I just want to define what I mean by a domain. Um, domain, I, the way I look at domain, right? It's not just about verticals like a FinTech, e-commerce, supply chain, et cetera, but it's also about the type of customer you're serving, whether it's a B2C or a B2B, or in some cases also the stage of the company that you're working in, whether it's a startup or a large mature company. A lot of this changes how, uh, you know, what sort of hat you wear as a PM. And that's what I mean by domain. Um, so that's what I'll talk most about. Um, so let's let's kick on. So the, again, going back to the question, are PM skills domain specific? Um, I'm going to keep domain expertise aside for, for a few seconds. I will come back to it, but I'll keep keep that aside because that plays a very big role when you switch domains. And, and I cannot underestim you know, you know, underestimate how important that is but keeping that aside i would argue that there is a core set of pm skills that you need irrespective of the domain um, after all there are only so many colors that you can pick from right so there are only so many skills that you need to learn um, but 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 bear with me you know i'll get to what those skills are i'll bear with me you know while i make the case for pm skills being domain agnostic now as i said there are different paths to becoming a pm in my own case, I started from customer support um, you know, and eventually landed up uh, as a PM. And when, it, when I did that, I did not have to unlearn what I learned as a you know, customer support agent. In fact, if, it, if anything, it helped me in building customer empathy. And throughout your PM career, you will switch from one domain to the other. And when you do that, you know, what changes, therefore, is the mix, right? You may have to dial up or dial down a skill um, for I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, in my very first role as a PM, I'm going to switch back to uh, so that you can also you know put a, put a face to the name. Um, in my very first role as a PM, I actually was co-developing a product for um, Anchor customer actually here in Bangalore. There, the focus was all on execution, um, in, in prioritization. You know, if you're working with an Anchor customer, um, you have a barrage of requirements, and you have to then filter on what is relevant or what is not relevant what's relevant for your customer, but also what's relevant for the product in the long term. Um, so the focus was, was a lot on um, execution. At a later stage in my career, I was turning around um, uh, e-learning business, you know, as different a domain as you can possibly get from what I used to do in the past. Um, but here the focus was completely on go-to-market and product strategy because we were trying to turn around a service-based business into a product-based business where it was more about product market fit, uh, given there's a lot of competition, 
um, it was it was completely focused on that. In fact, I probably I did not write a single you know user story or anything like that you would t expect of a typ typical PM. So um, what changes really is the mix of the different skills you use equally. Um, let me see if I can switch back to this. Equally, what changes is what tools you use, right? Um, so for instance, if you're managing a on-premise application like um, like like what I do um, at Intuit desktop application, you may have to use offline tools like surveys to test your ideas because you cannot just say that let me just put it out and see what happens because it's not an online or a mobile product. We do that do that a lot here um, when we serve uh, small business customers. In a B two C environment, you could just say uh, let's let's launch a V one and see what happens when we can focus a very narrow set of users and iterate iterate and eventually get to the rest of the base. Um, in fact, if you're managing a mobile app, you're probably spoiled for choice in terms of the number of options you have. Um, so depending on your domain, the tool you use is different. The, the underlying skill may be the same. It's the same customer empathy or it's the same need for rapid experimentation, but how you do that changes from domain to domain. And once and as you work across different domains, what you learn to do is that um, what changes is that you know, the, the way you mix and match these um, capabilities and the skills changes and therefore in fact I would argue that it's actually desirable that you switch um, uh, I'm not encouraging you to quit your current jobs but I'm, I'm just saying that it's actually desirable to switch domains in your career so you actually build a broader PM toolkit over a period of time this helps in two ways um, it helps in the fact that you are you are not only aware of the different tools you can use but even more importantly, um, you actually are open to the fact that you could do, uh, you could use different tools for for uh, achieving a certain goal. And I'll talk a little bit about this uh, as with an example. Um, <clears throat> we were building a, a capability for our online product actually more recently, and where you know we try to use the best of both worlds between what you you typically use in desktop as well as in online. Um, if you've worked in mostly in online products or in mobile products, you know, the urge is to, is to just go push something, a, v, a V1, and just figure out at the expense of your customers. That might still be the right strategy if you're if it's free software, but if it's you know if it's a software where people are paying for it, um, experimenting at the expense of your customers is not that uh, straightforward. So what we did was use some of the tools that we typically use for our desktop products. We actually ran surveys to really build a uh, hypothesis on what is that narrow problem that we should solve first. We defined the V1 around that. We launched it, and once you have customers actually using it, um, we we have a we validated the hypothesis that that's the problem to solve. And um, with time, we realized that um, you know we can go ahead and add more capability uh, once we learn more and more from from our customers. So. Why is this important? Because the, the core set of PM skills is, is the same, but here, knowing that we have these tools and we have actually used in different domains helped us be aware of it, but also be more open to how we use them for the, for the, for the best impact. So to summarize, um, I would say there's a core set of PM skills, irrespective of the domain you're using, what changes is the mix and then the tools you use, and with experience over time, you learn how to mix and match these. So, um, so let's look at what are these core skills. I've been talking about them, but let's just deep dive into what these four skills are. Um, again, this this webinar is not really talking about what are the PM skills, but really try to understand how this changes from one domain to the other. And I'll try to emphasize that very specifically. Um, and there are many different ways of cutting what are the PM competencies. And we at Intuit, uh, for instance, have a slightly more elaborate version of this. But I've tried to summarize uh, summarize this into just four uh, basic skills and I'll drill down to each of them to uh, add more color. So let's get down with the first one which is customer empathy um, and that's the right place to st start always. Um, in other words, what is customer empathy? In other words, it's it's living in, in a day in the life of um, of your customer right? to understand what problems they, they face um, and these are problems that they may not articulate the way you want it. Uh, but you know these are problems, and you have to look at you know the what's what are those needle in the eye kind of pain points when you're looking at when you're work, observing them um, that you need to identify and also test with them how best you can solve for them. And there are many ways to do this, and there are many tools to um, achieve this. Um, you can visit your customer and observe what they do in their own environment. But you can always bring them to your uh, premises, but there's nothing like actually visiting them in in what they do and observe. Do not ask questions, but just observe. 
Um, we call this follow me home or FMH at Intuit. In fact, a peer of mine, uh, a colleague of mine who runs a payroll product um, in the US, um, he actually signed up to, he adopted an NGO um, so that he can actually see firsthand what it feels like to set up payroll using our own product and what it feels like running payroll using our product. Um, inspired by that, I'm actually now looking to do something similar here in, in, in Bangalore um, because there's really no better substitute for um, putting your, um, yourself in your customer's shoes than becoming customer yourself of your own product. Um, that's one way of doing it. Um, and going back to my earlier comment about where I started, I actually learned, I would say, customer empathy from the school of hard knocks. Now, what I mean by that is my first, very first role, um, I was um, I was supporting a soaps in, um, in a cosmetics manufacturer in um, in Cincinnati where where our software used to fail every every now and then intermittently right um, um, you know I wish we knew what what was going on but we didn't so every other day you know it would fail and you know I would dread that you know the call you know, I would wake up the first thing in the morning is look up my black good old Nokia phone to see if I can see that um, envelope um, icon. Um, and sure enough, every now and then you would find every other day I would find that call from the customer at, at uh, six in the morning uh, saying, Sundar, your, your stupid software failed again. Call me back. So, you know, I would say that you know, customer pain was and empathy was sort of imprinted into my DNA with, with that sort of an experience. And that's a great place to start. In fact, I would highly recommend at some point in time, even if your primary role, role is not, um, you know, uh, customer care and I would encourage people spending time there because that's the best place you can learn and build uh, what it means for, um, by customer empathy. But there are again more ways um, and I'll just give one example and stop which is I'm a customer of um, a fintech app here in Bangalore um, actually in Mumbai um, and if I had a problem and the founder set up a WhatsApp group with me and a couple of others in his tech organization to troubleshoot um, and, and through the process he learned more about why I'm doing what I'm doing, who I am, and how I'm thinking of using this product, great feedback and really understand how I'm using the product. These are all great ways of building customer empathy and there is no shortage of um, tools to do that. But what is important is the mindset and understand the value of why this building deep customer empathy is important. That's the first place. Because it sounds very easy, but actually it's very easy to forget as you get head, um, sort of heads down and get into your own world of uh, being a PM. Again, another example, um, going a few years ago, um, we were building a um, you know, version one of a you know, mobile ma marketing platform. Um, we had agents um, within the company who would do that manually today, but we wanted to build something that's more self-serving and uh, that, that our marketing clients and telco clients can use, them, use it themselves to launch campaigns. Um, we had so much expertise in the company that I, I thought, you know, we know what we need to know and we know um, how, where we are headed. We had design ready, you know, get, getting ready to start building. And in one of the product reviews, my manager said, you know, how are you testing it? Now it's a B2B um, setting, right? So getting customers to test is not easy. You can't just walk to your friends and say, hey, can you give me feedback? Um, or maybe you can, I'll come back to that. Um, so, but I was just making excuses. And my manager had a great idea that, hey, why don't you just go down to the agents who are in the same building, go talk to them, show them the design, get their feedback. After all, they are effectively the power users for something like this in the future. Why wouldn't you get their feedback? It was a no brainer in hindsight, but that's what I mean by, you know, it's very easy to lose lose sight of the fact that you need to build that customer empathy and, and, and have that drive your, your product decisions. Um, it was a wake-up call, um, and obviously, obviously, I talked to the agents, but also I reached out to other I mean, my friends who were marketing um, professionals, got their feedback. Again, the reason I mentioned here is that you know, um, depending on the domain that you are working in, you just have to find different tools, but the primary skill remains the same: is is being able to build deep customer empathy. So that's on customer empathy. So moving on, I'm just going to switch to the next one, which is. Again, it's a broad-based term, but what I mean by that here is at a high level, um, this is about deciding what to do and what not to do. I'll come back to this picture you see here uh, in, in a second. You'll see why I have this picture. Um, it was actually from one of my previous experiences. But you know, this is really about deciding what to do and what not to do and deciding what problem to solve, what is worth solving, and most importantly, what is something that you are best placed to solve that you can build durable uh, competitive advantage. 
all of this, of course, uh, underpinned and informed by customer empathy, right? So this is what at Intuit we call uh, customer-driven innovation or CDI, but that's that's in a nutshell. So the, going back to this picture, it's actually from a similar session from one of my previous um, companies where we went around, we had a bunch of go broad and a bunch of ideas uh, for the next year. And as a leadership team, we went each um, in, in, in turn, giving points to each of them and eventually went narrow on what are those areas that we will actually do and equally be explicit with the rest of the organization that these are the areas that are interesting, important, a lot of passion within the company, but these are the areas that we will not do for these reasons. Now, how this changes across domain, if you're if you're in a startup, an early stage company, in a lot of that, you know, it probably doesn't follow the process that I gave you, but it's probably more to do with finding the product market fit. Um, for a mature product, like like the one I just referred to, it, it may be a road mapping exercise for the next next year. Um, but but um, in an in a legacy product, you may you may not necessarily flex this muzzle as much as you would in a in a startup. In a st if you're in a startup, you're building a new product. It doesn't have to be a startup, but even if you're building a new product, you are in constant experimentation mode. You're probably using the scale day in day out. Again, the, the core scale is the same, but how much you flex over time changes. And then, sorry, uh, moving to execution. Again, I've, this is an umbrella item for many things, right? So under this, I would put areas like prioritization, going broad, and then going narrow on the solution, how you solve a problem. Rap and as part of that rapid experimentation, the typical product owner kind of uh, definition, all of that comes under this. Um, so some of the things like you know prioritization or or um, you know writing user stories, etc. I would say a completely domain agnostic. The sh there are some shades that probably change. For instance, if you're managing a very tech heavy product, um, you know your technical quotient on your on your requirements probably increases. But otherwise, you know, the the core skills are the same. Um, if you look at rapid experimentation as an area, again, um, going back to what I said about customer empathy, the way you build it, uh, the way you do rapid experimentation changes. For a B2C product, you can recruit a few friendlies um, to test your prototype, but even otherwise, you can be creative, um, right? For instance, we were looking at how to redo um, how you install QuickBooks and, and as a desktop application today. But the, we want to test a very uh, what we call the leap of faith assumption, which is that if we make it that simple, will customers actually do it on their own, or will they still call us? Um, but what we did, therefore, is we just built a pay, and uh, you know, we uh, added or enhanced our help page to indicate to uh, redirect customers to say that, hey, would you um, go and adopt uh, use this easy option? And what we found is that more than 60% actually clicked on that simpler option, saying that yes, I would be interested. Let me know when it's ready. So that gave us tremendous confidence to say that, yeah, let's go and build it even before. And we hadn't started building it at all until at, up to that point. So that, you know, you, there are creative ways of doing that uh, for, for uh, you know, in a B2C kind of product. In a B2B product, um, you have to be more creative um, again. So this is, again, further complicated by the fact that there is the buyer versus the user. Um, so you need to really test it for both personas, uh, among other things. So in the past, I've used things like annual conferences to set up a focus group. Um, we do that even now for our, for the um, QuickBooks product, where we reach out to our influencers who are uh, or our power users as well, who are accountants, and we get feedback even before we launch a product. Um, you know, coming from a B two B environment, when when I had a when a very few handful of customers, and we had to be very very creative. When I joined into it, the, the beauty was, you know, we had mil millions of customers that we can we can reach out to. So it's quick, the same skill, but really quickly adapt to different tools to reach out to to these customers. Um, having said that, uh, in ex execution is much more than that. It also I, I always put the areas like communication within that context, uh, and it's both internal communication as well as external. Internal, what I mean by that is evangelizing your ideas with with leadership. To get alignment, um, you know, to build a shared vision. Um, you know, the, because the first lesson you learn as a PM is that you really cannot do it on your own. So you do need people to work with. Um, similarly, uh, externally, you have to build. You have to you, you have to communicate what you want to build even before you build it. You have to shape the demand for the product. Um, you know, as a B two B PM, you have a very big role to play because marketing is going to look at you to um, you know for for content for content marketing. Um, and therefore, you know, here domains can sometimes make a very big difference. Um, 
in one of my previous roles, um, it, it was a startup and it was a B2B startup where I was, you know, PM or marketing, depending on the day, night of, um, depending on the you know, time of day. So, you know, um, I had to flex both my marketing muzzles as, as well as my PM muzzle differently. Whereas at Intuit, it's different where I have a, you know, much more qualified and competent marketers that I lean on. So again, uh, and the the skill uh, from an external communication is very, very key to be able to communicate what you plan to build or what you have built, but how you do that and it changes from one setting to the other. Um, and lastly, talent steward, and this is something you do not often hear, uh, but very, very critical. And and more importantly, this is not, not just for you know PM leaders or people managers, Re this really applies at every level. Um, and at at and at Intuit, we uh, you know I stress this repeatedly to uh, every every PM in in the, in the organization, because as you grow as a PM, you you begin to realize that it's not only about building your own PM skills, but it also it is also building and raising the PM craft of people around you. And that's as an individual PM, but as a leader, this is so important because you also start to realize that you need to build a diverse team. So that you take benefit of everything I've said before, which is the diversity that comes from different domains and the different perspectives, um, and that's the only way you can actually you know, avoid or you know, any potential blind spots over a period of time. And and as you can imagine, you know, talent steward is completely domain specific. There's really nothing specific to this domain. Now, you know, I've talked about these four skills. What I've not touched upon is um, you know the um, the importance of um, you know domain expertise, and I don't want to undermine that at all because that's a very very big part of it. Um, if if I you know I, I, I'll just take an example again because um, one of the products that uh, that we manage here is uh, payroll, and that's one area where it's it's immensely important that you have and build domain expertise. And here uh, the reason I did not mention this before is because. Um, you can build a domain expertise. You know, it's great if you have someone who who has this, but it's it's it is the only area where I think when, when you're switching from one domain to the other, you have the question you have to ask is whether I'm getting you know going away from all the domain expertise I built in one, let's say fintech, and if I move to a completely different domain, will I lose all of that? Largely so, because you know not all domains are similar. Um, and when you go to a different place, you have to ramp up very quickly to build that kind of expertise, leaning on people already in the company to help you build that kind of expertise. Um, but you know, I expect any PM to be smart enough to build that very quickly um, and, and be very smart about it. But I don't want to undermine because it's, it's a very, very uh, key important part of when you're thinking about switching domains. So, um, so just to you know, close out, you know, you know, you know, pull everything together that I've been talking about so far is, um, a successful PM builds on a core set of skills. Um, I talked about four, but you know you can cut it in many different ways. But these are irrespective of the domain. Um, over time, uh, what you you know what you as you're working through different domains, what you find is that you build your own PM toolkit, um, a set of um, tools for for each skills, which gives you different ways of achieve, achieving the same goal. Um, and the skill remains the same, but the, skin, the the tools you use are different. And as you grow as a PM, you learn what tool to use when. And you're building and you know, becoming more and more nimble, and and adapt to um, to your context and and um, and you know hopefully you know you use the, the right set of colors and the right sort of mixes and paint your own future on on the canvas that you're offered. So I'll I'll stop here and I'll see if there are any questions. Thank you, Sundar. Thank you. Very insightful. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So now uh, we come to the qu uh, question answers. Uh, uh, we have we have uh, one uh, very basic question that comes in from Chenma is uh, is that MBA mandatory to be a product manager role? If yes, then what specialization uh, what specialization do you recommend? Um, the simple answer is no. Um, I know I, I spent a lot of money on my own MBA, but I'll still say that um, you know the simple answer is <laughs> the simple answer is no. Um, it's just a means to uh, sorry, there's a bit of a lighting issue here. Um, it's just a means to uh, to an end. Um, you know you can build the same set of skills and and knowledge from different ways. If I just look back with my, in my own team, I have a mix of people who have and who don't have MBAs, and they're all equally successful. So yeah. Um, 
I, I wouldn't say it's mandatory. Um, it's one way to maybe acquire a certain set of skills much faster. Where it helps is um, trying to be, you know, one of the challenges I see some working with some of my um, engineering colleagues sometimes is trying to relate um, how you're so trying to solve a problem to what is the business impact. Um, and this is again, you can completely learn without an MBA. It's not that it's mandatory, but I think sometimes it helps. Um, it's almost like a crash course in in getting that muzzle very, built very quickly rather than over a period of time. But you can do that over a period of time in, in the right organization. Um, you will get that skill as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, so even uh, after, uh, after spending two years and uh, some money, I, I realized that I did MBA is not uh, thing that you know that can compensate with the what I learned on the job, which is far more valuable. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Coming to the next question, uh, it is from uh, Ranjit uh, Mandan. He says, "How to prioritize requirement if uh, your many clients using the same product and there is a custom requirement for everyone?" Yeah, uh, it's. Um, not Question, but I think uh, somewhere related to, uh, you know, setting a client expectation and client requirements. True. And I think here, um, being clear about, um, you know, so, so some set of guiding principles, it goes beyond really just the role of the PM. I think it's a broader organization question in, in setting up some ground rules and guiding principles on what you will and what you will not. Um, if your goal really is to become a product-based company, then you have to be categorical about what you will not and what you will. Um, and and um, to, to the specific question here, that will then give you as a PM the remit to say, you know, and I, I, I actually I maybe relate to my very first example where where um, we were at, we were working serving an anchor customer and anchor customers will tell you to build everything they want. Um, and you also have an incentive to do that because that's your first customer. But... But since you are in a, in a journey to build the product, then you then filter all those requirements to say, okay, th these are the problems that we will solve because we see this is a common um, uh, pain point across multiple customers that in our target um, audience. And then that's just identifying what problems to solve. And in terms of how you solve it, then you have to build it in such a fashion that it works for not just that particular instance, but that particular context, but in other areas as well. Um, but again, as a, going back to my earlier point, which is, to be able to push back and and say the, say what I just said, you need the backing of and and the understanding at a broader level in the company that that's the path we want to take. The shortest path to success in there would be you know just go build the exact uh, specific requirement, move on to the next one, but that will not build your product. Okay, okay. So um, uh, next question is uh, looks like more of a comment and then asking for your views. Uh, coming from Manas is uh, uh, product managers needs to be quick learner, both the business domain as well as uh, tech stack. A uh, tech stack uh, it runs upon. So to really succeed, uh, to really succeed and talk the same language, uh, the tech team is talking and the same language. Uh, if you want to convince them to do what we wants to, you know, yeah. uh, what we wants them to do as a PM. Uh, he changed, sorry, uh, shuffling between too many things. Uh, so he, uh, Manas has changed the domain recently and took around six months to align himself to a different domain, new tech stack. So mm -hmm. in a tech-based industry, quick learning is necessary. What are your views on that? I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think I mentioned this towards the end as well. I expect PMs to be quick learners. Um, learners of the domain, whether it's an industry vertical that you have to really get your yourself ramped up to, or it could be in this case, um, your tech stack. Um, and, and it's very true. I completely agree that for a successful PM, you need to understand not at the you know weeds level, but you need to understand the tech, technology and the tech stack. Just as um, if you're an engineering, um, if that's your career path, you still need to be to be successful in the long term. You need to understand the customer side and the, and the business side. So I think, you know, the gone are the days when you can just focus on one one area. To be successful, you need to have a broader understanding for having the right conversations, for being able to make the right trade-offs at, at times because um, you, you know, constantly look at uh, not only solving customer problems, which are much more customer facing, but every now and then you are looking at how do I make this platform sustainable in the long term? And a lot of them are technology decisions. And you don't want to be completely cut out um, in, in that sort of addition because ultimately, 
you will have it will come back to you to as a pm to prioritize uh actually next questions comes from a more of a scaling point of view mm-hmm. where uh, uh, uh where they wants to know that what are the things a product manager would need to learn or be aware of if they are working for a core talk a core technology company like hp and interested in applying for a job in a fintech company for say a city bank or or even into it i think the i partly i would say the first thing is changing the mindset um i was i was talking to a colleague of mine a friend of mine who works in a similar i would say i want to say core technology company and um and you know he was saying with the way we look at customers is you know our customers are our partners and that's it but the products that that they ship eventually is in the hands of people like you and i um and why would you why would you not therefore talk to such customers um when you're building your product although you may not be directly selling to them and that probably applies to if you are working in a, a company like hp or, or a core technology um, company is think about how your end customers use it and use that uh, customer empathy to build your products i'll give you an example of my own um i was uh, we, were, we were serving um, you know mobile operators telcos uh, and we were building mobile loyalty uh, platforms now my customer in this instance is is a telco but e- eventually their customers are again people like us and they are the ones who are going to use this mobile app that we were planning to launch for the com- for the telco if i don't put my uh, uh, myself in the shoes of the end customer i'm going to design something which which good looks good on paper but but and the success, chances of success are not very good so before you think about you know moving to a different domain and fintech etc i think the first thing to realize is um ch- switch your mindset to really understand your end customer and in this case truly the end customer um and if you do that and really doesn't matter you could be in a technology company um and and still be completely relevant to a completely different domain like a fintech yeah interesting uh next uh, uh, question actually there are two questions from two different uh, uh, uh people uh, i find it a little bit relevant so i'm putting it together uh, yeah. one says the uh, one asked for how easily Uh, a technical product owner can become a full fledged product manager okay and then the uh, second product uh, second question that comes in says what are the key difference uh, in skills between project and the product manager okay um i'll talk about the first one first second one is probably a longer answer um the first the, the technical product manager it's a bit similar to the previous question where if you limit yourself to um you know in many cases if you're a technical product manager your customer could many in many instances could be an internal customer um or it could be a b2b organization that probably uses your api for instance um <clears throat> in both cases i think i would i would challenge to really understand what is the end to end chain and who is eventually using it and start from there um if you take that mindset if you really get into the weeds of understanding how this eventually plays out um because you know you may be providing a capability that's used by someone else um that we eventually used in to build a product for a customer um try to understand how that plays out and that will inform you better on um a you have, have a much better understanding of your broader market is evolving who else could be uh, disintermediating disintermedi- you in in the long term all of that becomes more apparent when you know where you are in the value chain if you just narrowly focus on your own t- t- technical product domain you will you can get blindsided um, in the future so uh, that's that's very important but also you can that helps you influence how you're prioritizing looking at your product and defining your product in the long term and lastly of course you know you would you know you, you would easily become a preferred vendor for for whoever you're serving if you show that you can truly understand not just um, the the product but their end business so i would say yeah that's a mindset mindset shift that you have to think about um so that you can eventually if you want to move from being a technical product manager to a i want to say customer facing product manager that doesn't look like a big leap of faith um on the product versus project manager these are different skill sets um there are there are some commonalities no doubt um because to some extent a product manager also has to have you know core or basic project management skills 
um, because ultimately you want to see your product uh, ship, shipped out of the door um, and you know sometimes you just do what it takes to get it done um, and and which means that um, you you know you set the processes up you define um, processes to get you uh, get you there um, in some cases you may not even have a project manager and we're kind of the pro product manager becomes the default de facto pro project manager um, so, but the other ways around is probably more challenging, and this that needs requires you to reskill. Going back to the four skills that I talked about, uh, from moving from a product project manager to a product manager, you have to think about these four skills and see which of your existing skills um, help you. And going back to um, in the fact that there are different uh, paths to becoming a PM. If you are coming, in my case, I came from um, you know customer support, so I had, I would say, I had some of that customer empathy skills uh, that I could leverage from my first, uh, from my previous job. If you are a project manager, you can leverage a lot of those skills from an execution skill perspective. You know, you have a lot of lot of those in you, uh, but you have to go back and complement that with with the other skills that you need to build. Yes. Yeah, so, uh... Next question that I would like to uh, bring in has been asked in a different, uh, has been responded in a different ways, but uh, but uh, Ahad Khan asked for looks like a product manager is an experience oriented skill. How to how to make an entry? I understand a great product manager comes with an ex comes up with experience. How to be a good uh, how could be a good manager? So I think he wants to understand that. If he needs to start his journey into the product management, what are the core uh, uh, skills that he needs to develop? Yeah, the core skills is is something that I just um, talked through earlier. Um, yeah, there, there are no born PMs, right? So all of us have started somewhere and eventually landed. Um, especially in, in, in a few years ago, when product management as a as a function wasn't fully let's say mature in in India, um, you had to start somewhere else, and eventually you landed as a product manager. So yeah, you have to start somewhere. So I wouldn't say that you know if you have not been a PM before, you can never be. Uh, that would mean many of us wouldn't be where we are right now. Um, what I would say is be very deliberate about um, you know uh, how you approach it. If you if you think this is a career option that you really want to consider, look at the skills that I just talked about um, and get mentored by other PMs so that you know what are your blind spots, and then be very deliberate about how you will acquire those skills preferably from a position of strength in what you're doing already but you may need to do a bit of reskilling um, in parallel or in your current role um, in one of the typical um, in one of the uh, common advice i give for people who have been who are in other uh, other functions but want to move to product management is try to see if you can buddy with an existing pm in your current um, you know in, in the sphere of influence in, in whatever you're doing right now let's say if you're an engineer and, you, and there is a pm that's pro that you're probably working with Try to see if you can buddy up with him to help him or or shadow him to learn what what it means to be a PM, um, and then maybe you start from there and then probably PM something very small, become a PM for for something very small, and eventually you can show that yes you demonstrate to yourself and to others that yes you have the right skills. Then and somebody somebody will then take a bet on you to say yeah um, I would uh, I would look at you as a PM for the there is an opening why don't you apply for it right so. Doors open when you show the commitment that uh, this is a this is a career option that you really seriously want to consider, and you have been very deliberate about how you want to get there. Uh, Sundar, uh, such a questions are coming, uh, you know, at time and again, and I would like to go a little uh, deeper into it. Uh, say, putting it this way, uh, if I ask you, uh, what skills do you see uh, in a product manager when you are hiring a product manager? What would you say? What are top three or four skills that you would look into a product manager? Um, first and foremost, we look for is, is customer customer empathy. Um, again, uh, if you're depending on at what stage you're coming in, if you're a very early career or you've never been a PM, I really look to see whether you know you have the basic um, compassion and empathy in what you do and who you are as a person. Because if you have that, you can translate some of that to really understand and get in the shoes of your customers. If you're coming in at a later stage and expect you to already have had exposure to that, um, and I want to see how you think about it. Um, again, you may not call it that, but I just want to see how you think and that does that lend itself well to when you come in, um, you, you can always, and it's a skill that can be coached, no, no doubt, but do you have the right mindset? That's what I look for. Uh, that's first and foremost. Um, 
the second is a um, lot of the execution skills uh, again depending on the stage you come in but let's say i'm still talking earlier career a lot of the execution skills which includes um, clarity of thought and being able to structure a problem um, so that you are able to look at the you know based on your customer empathy, you've, you've identified a lot of problems but how do you narrow down to what to solve how do you not narrow down to how you solve um, and, and core prioritization skills to get there um, third I would say is being able to communicate because um, in communication has multiple shades I just don't mean pretty slides by communication I mean how, how how are you able to articulate your point of view um, to your stakeholders because you know PM is a role where you you really are uh, in working through through many people and facilitating decision making and a lot of that needs building the right level of um, you know the right level of communication um, with your stakeholders so I look for that how are you able to through an interview process or what we call at into an A4A we look for whether you are able to tell the story uh, for the for the problem that you're trying to solve during the interview um, and and convince and communicate with your point of view showing humility in the fact that you don't know everything about this domain that we have given you to solve um, but equally having a point of view and a conviction in what you're trying to solve for um, and all of the, this these are the things that we look for in within a within a half a day hmm. so uh, uh, analyzing how uh, how a person could empathize to a customer and how better he can articulate his messages across team and across stakeholders that's what yeah two top most yeah. priorities for you, right exactly Great. so uh, next question uh, that comes in uh, from a technological uh, angle uh, or technological technology uh, uh, knowledge is of a, of a, of a uh, project a product manager. So the question comes in from Abhijit asked for what about the next in technologies and continuous learning for product managers? How does say a cloud market and uh, on premise has uh, has an impact on uh, PM role now now that people are moving to cloud and there is very less of uh, on-premise products and does the product manager also should be on top of technologies too um, the last one is easy to answer absolutely um, uh, <laughs> largely because <laughs> la largely because you know you want to take advantage of uh, changing a technology um, and you also want to have the right conversations with your um, technology uh, counterparts um, but but in terms of, um, I forget what you, uh, your first part of your question was around. Uh, can you say that again? Uh, this was about uh, how does a, a cloud market or no more on oh, yeah. on price has an impact on the field? Yeah, um, I think cloud versus um, desktop or on premise. On um, I would I would say um, not so much uh, in terms of because the core skills again. Uh, I'm probably repeating myself, but core skills remain the same. What I see just looking ahead is in the when you look at more from a ML perspective and, and the way you solve problems, the way you identify and solve problems changes very dramatically. Um, it's not it's never it's not uh, linear now, but it becomes even more nonlinear in the way you pr look at a problem because um, you, you know, in many cases, these are not very well articulated problems from your customers and you are working with a different set of stakeholders such as your you know, data engineers and data scientists to figure out build a model even before you um, have put anything in front of the customer right so the, the who you work with and how you work with and design probably is an element that comes very later uh, than what it does today right so i think the way you work um, will change or is already changing um, uh, fairly very fairly significantly um, but that's more looking ahead from um, ml and, and building data driven uh, or intelligence driven products versus i would say um, you know on-premise versus cloud. Okay, um, I'm just looking at, uh, we're seeing uh, so many questions coming in. There are many questions, uh, I have a request from uh, to the audience. There are many questions that are coming in from a different uh, elements of product management roadmap and you know uh, different areas of uh, product management. Uh, I'm not taking uh, such questions at this moment because the, we are basically focusing on the product management skills and their uh, uh, relativeness to the uh, domain uh, areas. So the uh, next question that comes uh, to me is how quickly can a 
product manager scale up in a new domain particularly when somebody is coming from a less regulated uh, domain to a very highly regulated uh, domain yeah um, i would really hope that you have, if you're moving making that switch that you have people in the in the new organization organization that already know uh, the regulation regulatory regime um, when i joined when i joined british telecom this is many years ago um, had no idea of telco let alone regulation in the uk market um, but i had many 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 people who knew this much 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 better than i ever would um, so i could lean on them really understand very quickly um, at least sufficiently enough to for you to be able to make the right decisions and then you, over time you become an expert um, but yeah uh, i you know if you're making such a switch think about who and where you learn that domain from uh, it need not of course it need not be in the same company it could also be within your mentor circle or or your circle as such um, that that can help you navigate the initial days until you become an expert yourself yeah so uh, i mean idea is to keep learning about the newer domains and the regulatories themselves yeah because no better than you can you know help yourself yeah uh, help yourself is easy to, i mean but it takes time um and that that's where I, i'm saying that you have to think about uh, you know again be deliberate about how you would uh, acquire these um, these um, you know the, the domain expertise in the early days um, whether it's within your company that you're joining or or somewhere else uh, in your friend uh, friend uh, friends and family network um uh, yeah this is a very practical question that has come from patricia is saying uh, you're facing an interviewer uh, uh, and going for a product manager role so she asked uh, if you require to shift to another domain like say banking or insurance to retail and you notice that interviewer would expect uh, uh, the interviewee to have a domain expertise so in that case would it be it would be tough to crack through how can handle such situation well if the interviewer has seen your cv and um, and called you for an interview i'm assuming that a he's understood that you don't have the domain expertise and therefore he's not very tied to the domain expertise so i would I, i think if you've crossed that first stage i think you're in a good place because you're having the right conversation with the right person um, or i'm not saying it, it's not ever important but at least in this instance if you've got to that stage um, hopefully that's less critical um, so If, and provided you've gotten to that stage the, the key thing is to understand uh, from the from the interviewer what are the skills he's looking for beyond the domain and then try to relate to your own past and, and explain how you can deliver on those skills um therefore the only thing that you the only gap that you have to fill for once you get into the into the new role is um filling for the domain and i'm hoping that including the interviewer and others in the company can help you do that if you can convince that the only gap is the domain i think you probably will have the job yeah i mean uh, so what you're saying is um uh, uh if somebody has called you for such interview that means they have considered that exactly uh, otherwise yeah they probably wasting their own time and yours obviously yeah yeah um so uh, yeah another uh, another very uh, you know feasible questions that comes in you talked about four key elements of uh, product management skills uh, now the question comes in that a product manager is also required to look out for the cost factors that becomes very important for them and yeah. uh, uh, then the uh, if all of it if any one or uh, all of the four uh, elements that you said get a hit on the cost how do you uh, balance the same what's your views on balancing the same i think um here you have to align with your um you know what are the leadership is in in if or if you're part of the uh, the team is to align and uh, on what are the key priorities and what are the trade offs um because when it comes to trade off then you have to be clear where where you're going to swing is is it cost versus um a revenue opportunity for instance if that is clear then i think your job in terms of prioritization becomes easier because you can then say that um all things considered if um if costs are more important then we will go after x y and z versus something else which are more revenue generating um but if you don't have that clarity up front 
um, you know, in, then you get into sort of a lot of the biases when you're looking at how to prioritize it because um, the, the, the set of issues on hand start to influence. That's why I think it's important to be very clear about uh, given where you are and where you want to be, what are the priorities and here's the stack rank at the higher level. Um, then, then it becomes clearer where you draw the line and how you trade off. Thank you. Thank you, Sundar. We have a lot more questions. As I told you, many of the questions are related to uh, product management or different strategies of product management and all, while uh, we are mostly talking about the uh, you know domain expertise and the uh, domain skills in the product manager uh, role. Sure. Now, in interest of time, uh, uh, I would take uh, one last question, okay? And uh, that is... Uh, uh, that is another some sort of a, a practical question, I think, which has been answered in many uh, different ways. But still, uh, if you could give a little practical insights to it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the Devender asked that his uh, current organization has uh, no product manager role and he's mm -hmm. a solution architect. How do I get a chance to uh, get to an interview because I can't put anything on my CV which is relevant to the pro uh, product manager? If you're a solution architect, I think you you have, again, um, I think at least one step into the door already, because um, to be used, and I, in, in my one of my previous roles, I've actually done exactly that. I've, um, if you're a solution architect or a consultant, you you, sh you can demonstrate that you understand, um, you know, you spend time with the customers, observe, understand, talk to them to understand what, what problems to solve, how to solve it. Um, you demonstrate that you can get uh, things done. You demonstrate that you can actually work with different stakeholders on technology on one side, the customer on the other side, and other other stakeholders within the company to de deliver the solution. So I think you are, you are showing again. It, you know, think about um, how you can map what you do today and what skills you have today to what is required from from being a PM, um, and then identify the gaps and there will be one or two deltas and think about how you will actually go about that and filling those gaps. But I wouldn't be hung up too much about, oh, I'm a solution architect and I'm not a product manager, therefore I can never become one because um, it, it, it in, in reality, it doesn't work that way. And it's more about, and in fact, I, you could be a product manager today, but really do a completely different role in, in reality, which actually is not very useful for, for, for uh, when you're applying. Then it's I would rather have someone who actually is, doesn't have the necessary title, but has played the right role, which is relevant and can demonstrate, most importantly, can demonstrate that you can put all this together. Part of the reason for why um, at Intuit, we, you know, we of course look at the CV, et cetera, to, um, to for some of the initial stages, but eventually um, you will be given a case to work and, and come back and present your, um, your craft. And that's your best shot. And at that point, your CV and everything else, you can literally bin it um, because what you will actually show is what you can do and what you have done um, in in front of um, the the panel, um, there your title, everything else becomes irrelevant. So um, I would say showcase the skill relevant skills for the for the PM role. Uh, less be less hung hung up about the specific titles. Thank you, thank you, Sundar. Uh, and as I told uh, uh, told uh, all the audience people that please do leave your feedback at the end because that helps us a lot to. Uh, uh, to define and design our, our, our forthcoming sessions. Uh, and we'll also get to know that uh, what are you looking up to and can we add what we have already, uh, can we add something new to what we have already planned. Uh, to let you know that we have uh, next uh, uh, webinar in the product management area, uh, in the on the product management subject on the 28th February, which is about uh, products without borders. We'll talk about more on uh, 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 more on developing uh, products out of India for across borders uh, and subjects like uh, those uh, to be delivered by uh, Ms. Lal uh, Lalita Ramani of Walmart Labs. Thank you, Sundar. Thanks, thanks for your uh, time and efforts of putting it together and come on board uh, with us. Uh, I'm sure the uh, audience enjoyed this session and we got a great insights uh, uh, from, from your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Vibor, and I highly recommend the next session. I'm going to be there as well. So hopefully see you guys there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you soon.